Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, Bill sends his apologies, uh, but there's not much he can do about uh, the local power situation where he is. Uh, hopefully he'll, he'll get power restored and he'll join us a little bit later. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, so let me just go ahead and do that. Okay. Um, so I wanna give you a little bit of background first in how the book came about. Um, and it really was a, a result of the uh, LGBT Center in Central Pennsylvania uh, deciding that it needed some programming around its uh, Aging with Pride group, which is a seniors, uh, LGBTQ seniors um, group within the center. And so they were looking for ideas and I uh, decided to uh, uh, ask them if they wanted to uh, create a story circle uh, to, to have some older members of the community talk about uh, what their memories were about living in central PA earlier in earlier times and uh, what it was like uh, in, in terms of uh, discrimination they faced and so forth. So we did that and uh, we had a really successful program. Uh, people were really interested in, in knowing more about these stories and this history. And so uh, we decided that we really needed to create a project in order to document and, and collect these stories and, and collect uh, the materials that supported those stories. So we concluded that oral history needed to be an essential component of that. Um, and uh, we ended up um, creating a, pro a project that was pretty comprehensive. And, and our mission is really to engage people to discover, document, collect, preserve, and present <clears throat> the history of the LGBTQ plus community in central Pennsylvania through oral histories and material culture. And along the way, you'll see a lot of uh, materials here, uh, photographs of uh, materials in our collection, both historical photographs, as well as artifacts and other uh, documents. So our collection has grown very rapidly. About 150 oral history interviews have been done to date uh, with transcriptions. Uh, most of those are online uh, at this point. We're, we're getting uh, more of them online every day. Uh, and we uh, collected more than 120 linear feet of archival documents and, and artifacts. Um, we decided that we weren't in a position to really um, have this collection at the LGBT Center. It was not going to be uh, feasible to do that. So we developed a partnership with Dickinson College Archives, uh, which is the repository for the collection. Um, they've been a terrific partner uh, with us. They've been They've embraced the collection wholeheartedly, and um, it is now the fastest growing collection of their archives, as well as most used collection of their archives. They have many students and professors that use the material, as well as uh, visiting uh, uh, scholars and things like that. So uh, it's definitely a, uh, uh, a very well used collection. Um, in addition to collecting the material, we wanted to have a way to present uh, materials to the public. Uh, we do that through exhibits, through physical exhibits out in different places, as well as programs like lectures and films and things like that. <clears throat> and we also have a lot of digital content, especially since COVID hit. Uh, we've really turned to the, to the web as being a way to uh, have more of a presence uh, in the community. And we've uh, been able to do 12 digital exhibits to date. Um, and we have uh, guides to our collections online, uh, as I mentioned, oral history transcripts online. Um, and we have uh, a lot of our oral history um, interviews on video on YouTube. Um, we've also done a Google Maps database, which uh, has collected geographical information about where various pieces of history took place in central Pennsylvania. Um, and I think we've got about 400 sites that have been documented to date. Um, and a Flickr album of about 400 photographs um, and a collections digitization project, which, which we're in the throes of right now and trying to, I think we've digitized now about three or 4,000 copy or pages of documents. Um, and we're turning to our uh, historical photographs next and other other materials as well. well. I should mention too that we have three traveling exhibits that we've done uh, and those are available for places to 
um, display uh, free of charge. Uh, another part of the program is publications, and uh, we're talking about the book today. Um, and the book uh, came out um, in 2020. Um, and uh, it is actually a, a, an award winning book uh, from the uh, Mid Atlantic Regional Archives Conference. Uh, so we're proud of that. Uh, we also have a publication which we uh, just completed about a year ago, which is um, a self-guided uh, tour of LGBTQ historical sites in uh, Harrisburg. And we are currently working on one for Lancaster and for York. So, uh, and I'm eager to, uh, to uh, work with the uh, Lancaster uh, um, LGBTQ coalition and uh, other folks there to uh, um, look at that and add to it perhaps, and also uh, distribute it throughout uh, the, the Lancaster area. So uh, in terms of how the book got started, um, we, we realized that um, uh, we needed to tell the story uh, of Central Pennsylvania history that we've collected throughout all of these interviews and all this material. Um, but we didn't really know where to get started with that. And um, what uh, uh, what happened was um, we got a, uh, we, we did an article for Pennsylvania History Magazine, which is the state's, um, the, the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission's uh, quarterly uh, publication. Um, and uh, through that article, um, Penn State University Press uh, saw the article and thought, um, well, maybe is there a book in this? And so they contacted us and uh, talked to, talked with me about that. And I said, well, I, I said, yes, uh, we would definitely be very interested in that, but I didn't think that I would have the, the time to run the project and write a book and all that. So, and I'm, I'm really trying to enjoy my retirement too. Um, and so, um, about a week after uh, that conversation, I got a, an email out of the blue from um, Bill Burton. And Bill was living in uh, Philadelphia at that time. He had uh, uh, been living in Boston for many years and he and his partner moved to Philadelphia because his partner got a, a job there um, and Bill was retired. But he was looking, uh, he had recently gone back to college and gotten his master's in history. And he was looking for some way to apply that. Um, and he had a special interest in LGBTQ history. So he asked me if there was anything uh, that, that he could do to help us uh, in volunteering with the project. And, and he said he was especially interested in writing and, and would, would love to write a book. And so having these two things happen within a week of each other um, was, was quite uh, astounding, but it, uh, it led to um, creating the, the book proposal and, uh, and getting uh, approved for publishing by Penn State University. Um, so what is important um, is to know about this book is that a lot of books have been written about large cities, metropolitan communities, metropolitan cities, and, and so forth. And uh, those are places that it's easy to find that history because it's it's pretty well documented. A, a lot of it's been studied for uh, many decades now. So places like New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles and Chicago, uh, Philadelphia, even um, those are places that um, you know uh, historians have been concentrating their their efforts on. But they haven't concentrated a lot of efforts on all of those sort of flyover cities that they talk about, um, you know, the smaller cities and rural areas of the country. So there's not been many books written that are focused on um, rural areas. Um, the ones that have been written have been focused a lot on uh, personal stories or um, other experiences that people have had but have not talked about the formation of community in those areas. And so we wanted to tell the story of really how uh, growing up in central Pennsylvania, the experience, yes, but also what it was like in terms of activism and how activists came together and really formed 
organizations and networks and, and really started to uh, make a difference in terms of their, their own lives uh, right here in the, the central PA area. So I'm gonna run through uh, just a, a brief overview of the chapters of the book and, and talk a little bit longer about a, a few things. But um, in chapter one, we talk about discovery. Um, it's really the origins of community. It's the early coming out stories that we talk about, uh, how people grew up in the uh, 50s and 60s um, and, and really had no places that they knew to go, to go and meet people. and. Uh, and certainly no organizations. Um, and um, so one of the things that we talk about early on is um, the, uh, the, the formation of bars, the gay bars. So uh, in, in uh, central Pennsylvania, the first documented gay bar is the clock bar in Harrisburg, which was opened in 1938. Um, uh, by the uh, by, George Dare and his family, uh, who were straight, but they uh, welcomed gay people um, almost from the beginning of when the bar opened, and they um, they were able to make it known that this was a place that uh, that uh, gay people could come. Well, uh, back in those days, uh, it was pretty much illegal to serve gay people because they you could be charged with running a house of uh, disrepute or, or some morals clause or whatever. Um, so um, a lot of these bars were subject to um, raids and, um, and were subject to even closure. And that's what happened at the clock bar. In uh, 1965, after it had been raided a few times before, but the people would, uh, would have to line up and have their IDs checked and, and they would be harassed a little bit. And then the uh, bartender would pay off the police, typically, um, to just uh, go away and not charge anybody with any crimes or whatever. So um, in 1965, um, there was a, a new district attorney, uh, Leroy Zimmerman, who was hellbent on uh, closing down uh, the, uh, the bar, the gay bars, the houses of uh, prostitution. Uh, street walkers and, and things of that nature. So he conducted a raid on State Street uh, and also the clock bar and um, the clock bar lost its license. Um, and a, a lot of people were arrested, about 30 some men were arrested um, and their names were printed in the newspaper and many of them lost their jobs, their careers, families, uh, friends and so forth. Um, so it was a devastating time for the city. Um, we also talk about Richard Schlegel, who was the first Central Pennsylvania uh, gay activist in the early 1960s. Um, and um, I won't go into detail on his story, but um, he, he basically uh, was fired from his federal job for being gay, fired from his state job for being gay. Um, so he lost a lot of um, uh, his... Uh, uh, livelihood from uh, just being out and being uh, visible and being uh, being gay. Um, Lancaster also uh, has some pretty early bars. Um, the Village Nightclub was uh, uh, located in Lancaster in the 1960s um, and in an area that's now be, had been redeveloped in the late 60s, I believe, and that's why it closed. Um, and it was a, a, a mixed bar, basically, a, a straight bar on the first floor and a, a basement bar that uh, LGBTQ people would go to. Um, I don't have a lot of documentation on that. That'd be a great story to try to get more material on. Um, the Tally Ho, of course, I think that a lot of people in uh, Lancaster or in the Lancaster area would be very familiar with that uh, bar. It opened in 19. 68 is a tally ho. It was a bar before then. It was a straight bar. Um, and uh, the uh, George Santini uh, and, and later his partner joined him in running that bar and, uh, and then opening the Loft restaurant in 1972. Um, and then the, um, uh, and by the way, the, the tally ho, which you, you all know was, was closed just recently, at, at its time of closure, it was the longest running uh, gay bar in uh, all of central Pennsylvania and 
Uh, it could quite be, quite possibly be one of the longest ever anywhere in the state, um, about 50 years. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's, it's a pretty, pretty amazing run. Uh, the Fiddler was another bar that uh, became a gay bar, and uh, that was in the uh, early to mid 70s, I believe. And I don't have much information again on that one, and we'd like to, to get some more material on that. Uh, the Sundown Lounge, uh, which is a predominantly lesbian bar, opened in 1976, and um, it's the only lesbian bar remaining in central Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, again, it's uh, it's still in existence and um, um, one of the few uh, remaining bars in Central PA that devoted, devoted to LGBTQ people. Uh, in our second chapter, we talk about the sort of next generation of activists after uh, Richard Schlegel. Um, and in the uh, Harrisburg area, Jerry Brennan starts a group called Gay Community Services in 1973. Um, starts out as a discussion group and then splits into two organizations, uh, Dignity Central PA, which is a uh, affiliated with the Catholic um, uh, religion, um, and the Gay Switchboard of Harrisburg, later the uh, Gay and Lesbian Switchboard of Harrisburg. Um, the Switchboard, uh, before the internet, was one of the few places that you could find information about the community and uh, places to go and uh, professionals that would help you in legal services or medical uh, services and so forth. Um, and then the Metropolitan Community Church of Harrisburg, um, MCC of the Spirit is what it's called today, um, that formed in, in Harrisburg and Vision of Hope, MCC in Lancaster, both of those came along around 1980, 80 plus. Um, and Lorraine Kajawa starts the Lavender Letter uh, newsletter, which is uh, uh, for women, for lesbians. Um, and that again was around 1980 or so. Uh, you can see Jerry Brennan down on the left there in that lower photograph. Um, um, in Lancaster, uh, also very active early in the 70s and 80s, um, Barry Weaver uh, founded a group called uh, Gays United Lancaster. Um, along with some other folks, including David Lees and, and um, Harry Long and some other people. Um, and uh, they started publishing uh, something called the Gay Era uh, newspaper. And this was really the first um, print publication um, in central Pennsylvania for LGBTQ people. Um, it uh, started around 1974, I believe, and then uh, ran through uh, pretty much the end of that decade. Um, other organizations and other surrounding cities and towns uh, sprouted up uh, in Reading, um, Allentown, the Lehigh Ho group, Lehigh Valley Homophile Organization. I love that name, Lehigh Ho. <laughs> um, and then um, Scranton, Williamsport, uh, there was a group in Lebanon. Um, and um, and then later in York, there was a, an organization as well. Um, and um, Barry, you can see Barry on the left there in that lower photograph. Um, and then on the right, Joe Burns, who uh, had uh, originally started out in, in um, Bethlehem, PA, um, and did work with the Lehigh Ho Group and getting that started. And then he moved to Lancaster uh, at some point and uh, got involved with the uh, uh, Gays United Lancaster as well. Um, in the third chapter, we talk about um, Penn State and homophiles of Penn State. Um, uh, this was a group that was formed in 1971, one of one of the earliest um, in the state in terms of uh, universities and colleges. Um, and uh, they were initially chartered by the uh, Student Government Association uh, pretty much unanimously. And then the uh, university administration just uh, weeks later um, realizes what this is and they uh, suspend their charter. Um, so immediately HOPS uh, started, started protests. Um, they actually had a, um, you can see the protest demonstration there on the lower picture. Um, they had 25 
other student organizations on campus come out in support of them at this protest march or at this protest rally. Um, and so Hobson ends up suing the university to get recognized. Um, and it would later be settled out of court and they were uh, victorious in getting their charter reinstated. Um, you, can, you can see the uh, um, Hops contingent there on the right. I love that uh, photo with the hi mom, guess what sign. Um, and uh, that was at the uh, first pride uh, parade in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, 1972. So uh, just to finish this story, um, Hops uh, got, got the out of court settlement. Um, and uh, there was a student activist who actually uh, signed on to that court case. And um, he was a, an education student and he had been uh, doing a student teaching assignment, was getting ready to graduate from Penn State. Um, and he lost his um, teaching assignments that later got reinstated by the court with back pay uh, or back time for credit for, uh, for his uh, teaching assignment. And, um, but he ends up losing uh, his teaching credentials. Um, they would be later reinstated by the state uh, education department. But they uh, they made such a, a big thing about it when they reinstated it that um, uh, Joe ended up losing his job. He, he he had been working in Montgomery County, Maryland school system to uh, uh, as a provisional teacher, and then uh, he ended up um, losing his job there. So uh, he never went back to teaching. So it's kind of a a sad story, but it shows the kind of um, discrimination that people faced back then in terms of their jobs and their positions, um, and uh, was a uh, uh, very difficult uh, time for people to be out. Uh, they, they often lost a lot from that. Um, and then um, in the fourth chapter, we talk about the um, uh, initiatives by Milton Schaap. Uh, governor Schapp, uh, first governor of the United States, to meet with gay activists in 1974. Um, he then created a task force as a result of that meeting um, to um, have people from the community advise state agencies um, on LGBTQ plus policies. That was November of 74 when that was uh, first initiated. And um, he was the uh, one of the first things I, that he did as a result of that um, uh, convening that group is that he issued an executive order uh, prohibiting discrimination based on sexual orientation for state employees in 1975. Um, he also formalized the task force then in 1976. Um, it became the first official governmental body in the United States devoted to improving public policy for LGBTQ plus people. Um, that is an amazing thing. Um, and, um, you know, the executive order, the first executive order of any in the country um, to prohibit uh, discrimination against uh, for state employees. Um, that was two years before California did it. So um, he really was ahead of his time in terms of um, being enlightened about LGBTQ plus issues. Uh, he was also the first governor of the US to issue an executive order proclaiming gay pride in uh, 1976. Uh, the council continued to meet for about 10 years and in its later years was um, very instrumental in public policy for HIV AIDS, making Pennsylvania one of the model states really in the country for public policy in that uh, area. Um, out of that group, uh, were a number of people from the central PA area and some of the rural, other rural parts of the state. And they started caucusing and they got together uh, and formed a coalition of rural organizations called the Pennsylvania Rural Gay Caucus. Um, this was the, an organization that, that held it first, the first gay conference in the state uh, in the fall of 75. Uh, they organized uh, the first lobby day for, uh, for educating the legislature about LGBTQ policy uh, 1976. 
uh, organized gay rights demonstrations in 77. You can see the picture of that one uh, there, the first, uh, first one of those. Um, that protest anti-gay legislation that had been enacted uh, or been tried to be enacted by the Republican-controlled legislature as a pushback to Governor Schaap's policies. Governor Schaap didn't sign any of those pieces of legislation, so they never became law. Um, and then uh, they also organized several other statewide gay conferences in, in sub subsequent years. In chapter five, we talk about the um, HIV AIDS uh, epidemic in, in central PA and across the world that um, and how we responded to that in central PA. Uh, and we'll talk about the earliest cases uh, being reported uh, then uh, uh, in, in Harrisburg, uh, the South Central AIDS Assistance Network was created um, basically by a few activists and volunteers. Um, in Lancaster, the Lancaster AIDS Project um, was a very important organization, and the Betty Finney House, which also uh, provided housing for uh, HIV AIDS um, patients as well. Give Us Hope and, and started in New York, which was another organization serving the New York area in the 1980s. Um, its founder got one of the uh, thousand points of light from awards from uh, the uh, Bush, uh, President Bush the first, <laughs> um, and um, then uh, also uh, the York House AIDS Hospice. Uh, you can see a photograph down there in the bottom uh, from that uh, organization. Uh, Joy Ufema, who uh, was really the, the, the mother, uh, considered the mother of hospice uh, care, uh, founded that organization. Uh, so there were fights for discrimination or non-discrimination ordinances. I'm going to try to speed through a couple of these. Harrisburg was the second in Pennsylvania. It passed unanimously. It included gender identity, which was an unusual thing at that time. Uh, York, uh, 1993, supported by a Republican mayor, uh, quite surprisingly. Uh, that passed despite efforts of a local pastor to defeat it. Um, again, read those stories in the book if you have a chance. They're pretty fascinating. Um, a lot more involved in that. Uh, I'll try to concentrate a little bit longer. I know I'm getting probably a little bit uh, long on time here. Um, I'll try to uh, work through a little bit longer here. Uh, talk about the uh, Lancaster fight for discrimination. Uh, so in 1991, um, the uh, well, I'll start back in 1990. Actually, there were a lot of um, uh, sort of incidents of gay bashing and other um, discrimination and harassment going on in the city, especially around the Tally Ho Bar. Um, and a number of um, people in the community um, felt that it was important that we that they um, start looking at ways of protecting the community, um, and so. Linda Martin, who was president of a Pennsylvania chapter of NOW at that time, uh, had written some pieces in the newspaper about the need for protection for the, the local uh, LGBTQ population. Um, Mark Stoner um, uh, became an activist at that time, and, and Nancy Helm and some others uh, from the community, and they formed uh, the Pink Triangle Coalition, um, and they started working towards uh, passive relief. Um, a local ordinance, uh, as well as Re Reverend Mary Merriman uh, from Vision of Hope MCC. And so they asked City Council if they would consider enacting an ordinance. And in May of 1991, uh, uh, after a couple of meetings prior to that, uh, this meeting, about 150 people were in attendance. Um, there was a lot of debate, uh, but the ordinance was approved. Uh, unanimously. And then there was a dispute between the, the city and the county. Uh, there was kind of a unique arrangement in Lancaster where the county and the city had a partnership um, to manage the Human Relations Commission. Um, both funded it, but the county held enforcement powers. Um, and unfortunately, the county didn't agree with the passage of the uh, ordinance that included sexual orientation. 
So um, there was pretty much a standoff on that issue for a while, but then it was finally resolved and they agreed to dissolve the joint commission and the county reestablished its own commission with um, no jurisdiction over the city. So the city was left without really any way to enforce its ordinance. Um, and there was just a lot of concern over the cost of creating a commission and uh, I guess some other issues, but uh, basically it went unresolved for about a decade. Um, so in the meantime, the KKK um, uh, took notice of this uh, ordinance fight and passage of the local ordinance, and they decided to hold a rally in uh, Lancaster and uh, support of the county's position. Um, and the march brought out a small contingent of marchers and about 4,000 spectators, um, mostly anti-KKK protesters, and about 350 local and state police to keep them separated. Uh, so after a very tense day um, of, of that going on, um, the uh, um, things quieted down a little bit again. But um, Nancy Helm, uh, who was one of the activists and, and had taken pretty visible position in support of the ordinance, um, this decided to open a uh, LGBT bookstore about the time that all this was going on um, in May of 1991. So about a month later, her bookstore was bombed. Um, it wasn't severely damaged the first time, but uh, then in August, a second more powerful bomb went off um, and caused more damage. Um, Nancy continued to receive threats for, on her life, uh, phone threats, people harassing her on the street, um, people following her in her car, uh, and many other kinds of incidents. Um, she finally, uh, well, business dropped off because of fear of people going into a store that's uh, been bombed twice. So she finally closed the bookstore about a year after it opened. Um, and uh, two weeks later, as it's turned out, the police actually finally uh, arrested five suspects and uh, they were all convicted except one juvenile who was determined to be mentally impaired. Um, so this then um, really went on for, as I mentioned, about a decade of um, not being able to enforce the ordinance. Um, finally, in November of 2001, the city created its own Human Relations Commission, and the ordinance was finally able to be put into full force and effect. Um, this just goes to show you the, the kind of long struggle that um, many uh, LGBT people have faced uh, throughout um, this whole period of time. Um, and uh, they, they persisted and they work, continue to work, and, uh, and that's, that's the only way a lot of this stuff gets done. Um, and that's a picture of Nancy. Uh, this was Nancy's dream, really, to open this bookstore. Um, she had worked in, in some other uh, places and, and had a, 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 a hair salon for a while. But um, she really, she went to Giovanni's room in Philadelphia and saw the bookstore there and really fell in love with the idea of opening a bookstore. So. This devastated her. She actually moved away from Lancaster for about 12 years and then moved back in, in I think 2006. And, um, but she's, uh, she still has a lot of raw emotion connected with this uh, whole period of time. Um, just to wrap up the last couple of chapters, we, we talk about pride celebrations in Central PA, which started with a, something called the Open Air Festival. They were too afraid to even talk about gay anything. So, they had to, to name it something that was not uh, quite uh, so obvious. Um, and that began in, in 1985 uh, for a few years. Um, after that uh, ended, um, uh, Nikki Nur started the Unity Festival, which was really initially done as a way to raise money for AIDS organizations. Um, that operated for, uh, I think, three or four years. Um, the Pride Festival of Central Pennsylvania was then created as a, uh, after that uh, ended, um, um, as a way to 
put a more um, strong, stronger face and, and um, um, you know, acknowledgement that it was a, an LGBTQ community event. Um, and that uh, actually is, is still in existence and uh, celebrated its um, 30th anniversary this year. Um, and Lancaster Pride came along shortly after that um, for a number of years and is, um, I think, uh, for the most part, it's been operating pretty continuously uh, as well. Um, and then uh, York, uh, the uh, York community has started something called the Equality Fest, and that's been in existence for a few years now as well. Um, chapter eight is really kind of toward the end of the story and then talking about some of, of the things that have happened since 2000. Uh, we talk about um, the Jennifer Harris story, a uh, young woman at Penn State who was kicked off the team by uh, a homophobic coach um, and ended up um, getting um, reinstated, but then uh, she, she went off to another place to play basketball. Uh, Transcentral PA, uh, we talk about the kind of rise of transgender activists and activism. Um, you know, there were very few organizations in the uh, prior to 2000. There was one called Renaissance Education Association in Pennsylvania that had a number of chapters, including one in Central PA. Um, and uh, out of that group grew this uh, Transcentral PA group which has been enormously successful. Um, they have um, uh, an annual conference called the Keystone Conference, which they draw about seven to 800 people to a conference in, in Harrisburg uh, every year. Um, so I, with that, I'm going to stop and um, entertain any questions or discussion and um, hope that you have gotten at least a a taste for what the book is all about, and uh, we'll, we'll pique your interest uh, in it. So I'm going to stop my share. Thank you so much, Barry. That was such a great talk and such an interesting history. So for a couple minutes, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Stoner, who, as I mentioned, is a Lancaster native and longtime activist in the LGBT community here. Um, so I'll give him a few minutes to talk, and then we'll we, we'll open it up for some questions. So uh, Mark can talk a little bit about the specifics of Lancaster and, and what it's been like to be here and where we are today. So Mark, you can unmute and turn on your video. Yeah, I'm unmuted now, but I still. <laughs> we can hear uh, you. Um, oh, there, there. You are. There we go. Sorry, you, I was cut off for a while there. So, <laughs> but I want to really thank Barry for all he's done tonight and for a couple, at least what, 10, 15 years on this. <laughs> um. And, you know, it's real relevant um, because today a lot of the struggles are still going on. I don't know if people are aware, just tonight at Mannheim Township school board meetings, they're talking about transgender students again. Um, Henfield just recently passed a discriminatory policy against trans students, and I think it was the first a school district in the state to do that. Um, they took it upon themselves. So it's, it, it really is relevant. The other thing that happened this week, um, on Tuesday, I'm involved with a group called Embrace that helps religious faith groups become more welcoming. And it was a really successful evening. It was kind of looking back to what they've done in the last 12 years or so that they've been in existence. Um, here, I'm getting some pop-ups here that are, and, um, you know, some of the first 
well, in the 90s, the MCC, the Metropolitan Community Church, led by Mary Merriman, was really one of the vital uh, organizations that started that. So faith groups have been part of the discussion for a long, long time. The Unitarian Church in Lancaster has long been a supporter. Um, what people, I think, don't remember about, like, even me looking back to 1991, during COVID, I started looking at old newspaper articles and stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe so much stuff happened in one year. Because there was, you know, as Barry mentioned, the Klan march. There was also what was called a, the Wolf Pack attack, where a group of youths attacked a guy at night who they thought was gay. It turned out he wasn't. But um, that was in the news at the time. And also people like Nancy, who really put themselves out, like you didn't have many people back then that would actually be willing to be on the news or in a newspaper. Um, she would get not only criticism from the straight conservatives, but you'd also have people thinking, oh, she was looking, she looked a little too lesbian. You know, she had short hair and, you know, you'd hear like, well, why, why should she represent us? And I always felt like, well, get out there and represent us then if you're not happy with what she's doing. But she did take so much on herself. I met the other, the, the Gays United group from the 70s, there was vandalism to their cars. I, I think I, I think they someone actually turned one of the cars over or something like that. But um, you really did face that kind of discrimination and you didn't know what would happen, the, you know, let alone what what still can happen is there's no protection in most of Pennsylvania uh, if you're gay and, and working. There's, there's no discrimination protection except in cities like Harrisburg and Allentown and Lancaster. Um, and, you know, I've had friends <laughs> that have been fired or when at working with the Human Relations Commission, gotten calls from, you know, a mother who distraught because her son was working at some place and being harassed and just didn't know what to do. And there really wasn't much that you could offer at that time. Um, <clears throat> I guess the other thing that kind of resonated with me, Barry's uh, presentation kind of started with, you know, the 50s on, but there are roots and there are evidence of, of people long before that. Like, um, and I'm often kind of have thought about the number of people that have left Lancaster that have been very successful and have some gay roots or possibly may. You know, you hear about Robert Fulton all the time, but I never hear it discussed that he was in a bisexual relationship. He was in a menage a trois with, with a London couple, Ruth and Joel Barlow, and there's letters that Joel Barlow wrote where he talks about toots and that uses baby talk to talk about the sexual relationships that they had. Um, and, you know, everyone I think is pretty familiar with the discussion about James Buchanan and his relationship and what it, what it really was with Rufus Devane King, you know, I. I was in my 30s probably before I found out that the the our, the US's only bachelor president had a lived with the US's only bachelor vice president <laughs> for quite a long time. Um, and then uh, 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 Charles DeMuth, I think people pretty much know about the painter, uh, but in the 80s, that was something that really, you, the, was not discussed. I, I remember one of his sketches being exhibited, which showed a very explicit exchange between two sailors. And the the sign at that time said, like, this is a represents a little understood aspect of DeMuth's personality or something like that. And it was like quite obvious. Like um and one of the things that I found in 1913, there was a vice commission. It was kind of a 
thing going around at that time. Um, there was a vice commission formed in Lancaster and they did reports of prostitution and stuff. And that's the earliest example I've seen of them talking about what they called men perverts or fairies and degenerates. Um, and that vice commission report, which was basically a book that was printed up and then distributed to leaders in the Lancaster community uh, to try to get them to do something about this. Um, Charles DeMuth actually was quoted as coming on a train trip back to Lancaster saying he was coming back to speak for vice. Uh, and that's the name of a, a book on, on him. Um, so I'm kind of rambling a bit. I think I'll let people ask questions or we can just kind of discuss. Yeah, this is all really great. I think one of the things that's really great about those remarks is there are so many threads to pull on. There's so many yeah. suspicions in, in, in this history um, that hopefully we can start to ex excavate at Lancaster history. And I think there's always a combination of what we can find out as fact and what we imagine. And both are really important parts of how we engage with some of these histories that have been so you know, unwritten and have been, haven't been documented as well. So the first question that we have is, what was the address of the gay bookstore that was bombed in Lancaster? Um, it was I on Prince Street. Find that out if you give me a second. Hmm? <laughs> it was on Prince Street, right? Yeah, it was on Prince Street. If people are familiar with where Carmen and David's ice cream was, and I can actually find the address if you give me a second, but that's where it was kind of across from the Fulton, down from where Prince Street Cafe would be. Now the buildings have changed a bit. The, the name of the bookstore was The Closet and part of that was because it was teeny tiny. Um, the space has been kind of combined with another space now. All right, what was the most surprising thing that you found in your research, Barry? Oh gosh. <laughs> There were so many surprising things, I'll tell you. Um, well, you know, first of all, the surprising thing wasn't that there was a lot of discrimination, but just kind of the level of what people went through and still persisted and still uh, worked in activism. Um, you know, not only what Nancy went through, but, um, you know, Dan Manavel up in Williamsport was an activist who, um, was was uh, uh, appeared at a rally against Anita Bryant. Anita Bryant was a <laughs> crusader against LGBTQ folks uh, back in the uh, 70s, uh, and I guess through, through the 80s even. Um, but uh, he, you know, he appeared on local news, and um, soon there was a just a, a horrendous amount of vandalism on his house to the point where. Uh, the, the people broke out all of his windows, his door was broken into. Um, he basically couldn't live there anymore. He had to he had to move out of town. And this was his family home that he was raised in, his parents built. Um, so those those kind of things. And yet he is still an activist today. He's in his 70s and he is still going strong. <laughs> um, so you know, having having gone through all of that, um, it's just amazing to me to see people who just continue to inspire me um, with their tenacity and their, their persistence. Yeah, that's great. All right, next question is, were you able to learn anything about queer history in the Black or Latino communities? That has been very difficult for us. Um, we have not been able to find a lot of material on that, uh, despite the fact that we've been looking and we've been trying to interview more people in the um, the uh, Black and, and, and BIPOC community in general. Um, and um, I think one of the problems that um, we face is not only that we just aren't part of that community, um, so we don't have a lot of insight into that community, but also um, there was a lot of fear in that community, those communities, um, in terms of uh, family pressures and church pressures. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of that is, is very faith-based, even the Latino community with the Catholic church uh, influence. Um, 
that they really um, struggled, I think, to even come out at all and participate in the LGBTQ community. A lot of it was very underground, I think. Um, yeah, I, go ahead. I, I had a boyfriend for about a decade that was black. And so, and an earlier one <laughs> when I was in college and the, the one, so this would have been right late seventies, early eighties. Um, the one was a choir director uh, in the area and there was a whole network of all the choir boys. <laughs> You know, you'd go so that you'd go to a gospel. They all knew each other and they all, you know, in the private settings, handed up and, you know, in some ways were out, but just out to that tight network. Um, and publicly, you didn't really see it at all. I, I, I know there was uh, one African American that then married and ran for public office and uh, was a Republican that got, he was a black Republican. So he got a lot of support right away, <laughs> um, but was totally, I mean, closeted to the point that he he got married. Um, actually, the, the well, it, there was just a lot of that type of thing back then. I think probably, and still, lot, I, I think probably a lot of private parties and things like that went on. Yep. Um, Eric, Dr. Eric Selby is probably the only exception to, I'd say, you know, us, us being able to find any um, activists, uh, kind of um, people and leaders in the community. Eric, uh, we, we document his story pretty well in the book, um, and he was uh, very active in um, uh, the Harrisburg Human Relations Commission. He was uh, president of that or chair of that for a while, and um, also. Um, He's been very active and uh, he had a publication, uh, Crossroads Magazine, that he did for several years, um, ran the uh, Second Months Way to Pride Festival for several years, and, and he's now on our steering committee. So we're, we're uh, trying to engage uh, uh, him to, uh, to get out and, and try to find some of these stories for us in, in uh, Black community and, and other minority communities. I think you mentioned and in book that the protests of the KKK protests in, were, were some kind of an alliance with black what, black communities and gay communities. Was, am I remembering that right? Yeah, there were some uh, crossover um, with uh, both communities in terms of the anti-KKK protests that went on. And uh, I think the, the black community, Mark probably tells some of this too, but I think they were very supportive of uh, uh, our community as well. Yeah, they, they, I would say at that time, they worked together against the KKK. There was an effort to have a, a separate gathering away from the main march and things to kind of draw people away. But I would still say there was a tension, like you never heard a black minister saying he was there to support yeah. the, the ordinance, you know, that was for, and, and that's something that I think has changed a lot. You, you see a lot more people from the African American community that are really willing to stand up for the gay community now. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we have time for one more question. So we have a student working, looking at the Dickinson archives for the 1990s Elizabethtown family resolution stories. And they're wondering how we can best preserve what is happening today for the future. Well, um, that's a good point because history continues to happen as we <laughs> live through it. So uh, it's important that we start uh, collecting more and more of this contemporary material um, and uh, make sure it's preserved as well. Fortunately, a lot of the stuff now is in digital form and is um, a lot more accessible. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's important that we um, remember that every event that happens, you know, we need to collect the uh, physical evidence of that uh, event and, and um, uh, keep telling those stories. Yeah, and keep an eye out at, um, for what we do at Lancaster History. We do, you know, want to encourage community preservation projects as much as possible because, you know, these are, are your stories and, you know, we want you to be able to preserve them so that they're a resource um, for everybody. So keep an eye out um, for offerings that we may have as well. 
So we're just about out of time. I just want to thank um, both Barry and Mark so much for joining us. It was a really great, really great talk. Um, and it was great to hear from the local perspective as well as from somebody who's been working on, on the wider um, Central PA uh, history. So thank you guys all so much. Um, yeah, you can visit our website to see what we events we have coming up. And we have copies of the book in the museum store. I believe they are signed. So extra right. reason to, <laughs> to come in and, and see them. Uh, yeah, so thanks everyone for joining. And yeah, stay, stay in touch with us for more events around some of these histories in the future. Thank you so much. Thanks.